Romancing Mr. Bridgerton Part 3 Chapter 8 Colin Bridgerton and Penelope Featherington were seen in conversation at the Smythe Smith musicale, although no one seems to know what exactly they were discussing. This author would venture to guess that their conversation centred upon this author's identity, since that was what everyone else seemed to be talking about, before, after, and rather rudely, in this author's esteemed opinion during the performance. In other news, Honoria Smythe Smith's violin was damaged when Lady Danbury accidentally knocked it off a table, while waving her cane. Lady Danbury insisted upon replacing the instrument, but then declared that, as it is not her habit to buy anything but the best, Honoria will have a Ruggieri violin, imported from Cremona, Italy. It is this author's understanding that, when one factors in manufacture and shipping time, along with a lengthy waiting list, it takes six months for a Ruggieri violin to reach our shores, Lady Whistledown's society papers. The 16th of April 1824. There are moments in a woman's life when her heart flips in her chest, when the world suddenly seems uncommonly pink and perfect, when a symphony can be heard in the tinkle of a doorbell. Penelope Featherington had just such a moment two days after the Smythe Smith musicale. All it took was a knock on her bedroom door, followed by her butler's voice, informing her, Mr. Colin Bridgerton is here to see you. Penelope tumbled right off the bed, Briarly, who had butlered for the Featherington family long enough so that he did not even so much as bat, an eyelash. At Penelope's clumsiness, murmured, Shall I tell him you are not in? No, Penelope nearly shrieked, stumbling to her feet. I mean, no, she added in a more reasonable voice, but I will require ten minutes to prepare myself, she glanced in the mirror, and winced at her dishevelled appearance, fifteen, as you wish. Miss Penelope, oh, and make certain to prepare a tray of food. Mr. Bridgerton is sure to be hungry. He's always hungry. The butler nodded again. Penelope stood stock still as Briarly disappeared out the door. Then, completely unable to contain herself, danced from foot to foot, emitting a strange squealing sort of noise one that she was convinced or at least hoped had never, before crossed her lips. Then again, she couldn't remember the last time a gentleman had called upon her much less the one with whom she'd been desperately in love. For almost half of her life, settle down, she said, spreading her fingers and pressing her flattened palms out in much the same motion. She might make if she were trying to placate a small, unruly crowd. You must remain calm, calm, she repeated, as if that would actually do the trick, calm, but inside, her heart was dancing. She took a few deep breaths, walked over to her dressing table and picked up her hairbrush. It would only take a few minutes to rep in her hair. Surely Colin wasn't going to flee. If she kept him waiting for a short while, he'd expect her to take a bit of time to ready herself. Wouldn't he, but still. She found herself fixing her hair in record time, and by the time she stepped through the sitting room door, a mere five minutes had passed, since the butler's announcement. That was quick, Colin said with a quirky grin. He'd been standing by the window, peering out at Mount Street. Oh, was it? Penelope said, hoping that the heat she felt on her skin wasn't translating into a blush. A woman was supposed to keep a gentleman waiting, although not so long. Still, it made no sense to hold to such silly behaviour with Colin. Of all people, he would never be interested in her in a romantic fashion, and besides, they were friends. Friends, it seemed like such an odd concept. And yet that was exactly what they were. They'd always been friendly acquaintances, but since his return from Cyprus, they'd become friends in truth. It was magical. Even if he never loved her, and she rather thought he never would, this was better than what they'd had before. To what do I owe the pleasure? she asked. 
taking a seat on her mother's slightly faded yellow damask sofa. Colin sat across from her in a rather uncomfortable straight-backed chair. He leaned forward, resting his hands on his knees, and Penelope knew instantly that something was wrong. It simply wasn't the pose a gentleman adopted. For a regular social call, he looked too distraught, too intense. It's rather serious, he said. His face grim, Penelope nearly rose to her feet. Has something happened? Is someone ill? No, no, nothing like that, he paused. Let out a long breath, then raked his hand through his already mussed up hair. It's about Eloise, what is it? I don't know how to say this. I do you have anything to eat? Penelope was ready to wring his neck, for heaven's sake. Colin, sorry, he muttered. I haven't eaten all day. A first, I'm sure, Penelope said impatiently. I already told Briley Toffix a tray. Now, will you just tell me what is wrong? Or do you plan to wait until I expire of impatience? I think she's Lady Whistledown. He blurted out. Penelope's mouth fell open. She wasn't sure what she'd expected him to say. But it wasn't this. Penelope, did you hear me? Eloise, she asked. Even though she knew exactly who he was talking about, he nodded. She can't be. He stood and began to pace, to full of nervous energy to sit still. Why not? Because, because, because why? Because there is no way she could have done that for ten years without my knowing. His expression went from disturbed to disdainful in an instant. I hardly think you're privy to everything that Eloise does, of course not, Penelope replied, giving him a rather irritated look. But I can tell you with absolute certainty that there is no way Eloise could keep a secret of that magnitude from me for over ten years. She's simply not capable of it, Penelope. She's the nosiest person I know. Well, that much is true. Penelope agreed, except for my mother, I suppose. But that's hardly enough to convict her. Colin stopped his pacing and planted his hands on his hips. She's always writing things down. Why would you think that? He held up his hand, rubbing his thumb briskly against his fingertips. Ink stains, constantly. Lots of people use pen and ink. Penelope motioned broadly at Colin. You write in journals. I am certain you've had your share of ink on your fingers, yes. But I don't disappear when I write in my journals. Penelope felt her pulse quicken. What do you mean? She asked, her voice growing breathless. I mean that she locks herself in her room for hours on end. And it's after those periods that her fingers are covered with ink. Penelope didn't say anything for an agonizingly long moment. Colin's evidence was damning. Indeed, especially when combined with Eloise's well-known and well-documented penchant for nosiness. But she wasn't Lady Whistledown. She couldn't be. Penelope would bet her life on it. Finally, Penelope just crossed her arms and, in a tone of voice that probably would have been more at home, on an exceedingly stubborn six-year-old, said, It's not her. It's not. Colin sat back down, looking defeated. I wish I could share your certainty. Colin, you need to. Where the hell is the food? He grumbled. She should have been shocked, but somehow his lack of manners amused her. I'm sure Briley will be here shortly. He sprawled into a chair. I'm hungry, yes, Penelope said, lips twitching. I surmised as much, he sighed. Weary and worried, if she's Lady Whistledown, it'll be a disaster, a pure, unmitigated disaster. It wouldn't be that bad. Penelope said carefully, not that I think she's Lady Whistledown. Because I don't, but truly, if she were, would it be so very dreadful? I rather like Lady Whistledown myself, yes, Penelope. Colin said rather sharply, it would be so very dreadful. She'd be ruined. I don't think she'd be ruined. Of course she'd be ruined. Do you have any idea how many people that woman has insulted over the years? 
I didn't realize you hated Lady Whistledown so much, Penelope said. I don't hate her, Colin said impatiently. It doesn't matter if I hate her. Everyone else hates her. I don't think that's true. They all buy her paper. Of course they buy her paper. Everyone buys her bloody paper, Colin. Sorry, he muttered. But it didn't really sound like he meant it. Penelope nodded her acceptance of his apology. Whoever that lady Whistledown is, Colin said, shaking his finger at her with such vehemence that she actually lurched backward. When she is unmasked, she will not be able to show her face in London. Penelope delicately cleared her throat. I didn't realise you cared so much about the opinions of society. I don't, he retorted. Well, not much, at least. Anyone who tells you they don't care at all is a liar and a hypocrite. Penelope rather thought he was correct. But she was surprised he'd admitted it. It seemed men always like to pretend that completely unaffected by the whims and opinions of society. Colin leaned forward, his green eyes burning with intensity. This isn't about me, Penelope. It's about Eloise. And if she's cast out of society, she will be crushed. He sat back, but his entire body radiated. Tension. Not to mention what it would do to my mother. Penelope let out a long breath. I really think you're getting upset over nothing, she said. I hope you're right, he replied, closing his eyes. He wasn't sure when he'd started to suspect that his sister might be Lady Whistledown. Probably after Lady Danbury had issued her now famous challenge. Unlike most of London, Colin had never been terribly interested in Lady Whistledown's true identity. The column was entertaining, and he certainly read it along with everyone else, but to his mind. Lady Whistledown was simply Lady Whistledown, and that was all she needed to be. But Lady Danbury's dare had started him thinking. Unlike the rest of the Bridgertons, once he got hold of an idea, he was fundamentally incapable of letting it go. Somehow it had occurred to him that Eloise had the perfect temperament and skills to write such a column. And then, before he could convince himself that he was crazy, he'd seen the ink spots on her fingers. Since then he'd gone nearly mad. Unable to think about anything but the possibility that Eloise had a secret life. He didn't know which irritated him more that Eloise might be Lady Whistledown, or that she had managed to hide it from him for over a decade. How galling! To be hoodwinked by one sister, he liked to think himself smarter than that. But he needed to focus on the present, because if his suspicions were correct, how on earth were they going to deal with the scandal when she was discovered? And she would be discovered. With all of London lusting after the thousand pound price, Lady Whistledown didn't stand a chance. Colin, Colin, he opened his eyes, wondering how long Penelope had been calling his name. I really think you should stop worrying about Eloise, she said. There are hundreds and hundreds of people in London. Lady Whistledown could be any one of them. Heavens! With your I-4 detail, she waggled her fingers to remind him of Eloise's ink-stained. Fingertips, you could be Lady Whistledown. He shot her a rather condescending look. Except for the small detail of my having been out of the country half the time. Penelope chose to ignore his sarcasm. You're certainly a good enough writer to carry it off. Colin had intended to say something droll and slightly gruff, dismissing her rather weak arguments. But the truth was, he was so secretly delighted about her good writer compliment, that all he could do was sit there with a loopy smile on his face. Are you all right? Penelope asked. Perfectly fine, he replied, snapping to attention and trying to adopt a more sober mien. Why would you ask? Because you suddenly looked quite ill, dizzy. Actually, I'm fine, he repeated, probably a little louder than was necessary. I'm just thinking about the scandal. She let out a beleaguered sigh, which irritated him, because he didn't see that she had any reason to feel so impatient with him. What scandal? She asked. 
the scandal that is going to erupt when she is discovered. He ground out. She's not Lady Whistledown. She insisted Doc Collins suddenly sat up straight. His eyes are light with a new idea. Do you know? He said in a rather intense sort of voice. But I don't think it matters if... She's Lady Whistledown or not. Penelope stared at him blankly for a full three seconds before looking about the room, muttering, Where's the food? I must be light-headed. Haven't you spent the last ten minutes positively going mad over the possibility that she is? As if on cue, Briarly entered the room with a heavily laden tray. Penelope and Colin watched in silence as the butler laid out the meal. Would you like me to fix your plates? he inquired. No. That's quite all right, Penelope said quickly. We can manage for ourselves. Briarly nodded and, as soon as he'd laid the flatware and filled the two glasses with lemonade, left the room. Listen to me, Colin said, jumping to his feet and moving the door so that it almost rested against the doorframe but remained technically open. Should anyone quibble about proprieties? Don't you want something to eat? Penelope inquired. Holding aloft a plate that she'd filled with various small snacks, he snatched a piece of cheese, ate it into rather indelicate bites, then continued, even if Eloise isn't Lady Whistledown. And mind you, I still think she is it doesn't matter. Because if I suspect that she's Lady Whistledown, then surely someone else will as well. Your point being, Colin realised that his arms were reaching forward, and he stopped himself before he reached out, to shake her shoulders. It doesn't matter, don't you see? If someone points his finger at her, she'll be ruined, but not, Penelope said, appearing to require a great deal of effort to unclench her teeth. If she's not Lady Whistledown, how could she prove it? Colin returned, jumping to his feet. Once a rumour is started, the damage is done. It develops a life of its own. Colin, you ceased to make sense five minutes ago. No. Hear me out. He will to face her. And he was seized by a feeling of such intensity that he couldn't have ripped his eyes from hers. If the house were falling down around them, suppose I told everyone that I had seduced you. Penelope grew very, very still. You would be ruined forever, he continued crouching down near the edge of the sofa so that they were more on the same level. It wouldn't matter that we had never even kissed. That, my dear Penelope, is the power of the word. She looked oddly frozen and at the same time flushed. I, I don't know what to say. She s-d-a-m-m-e-r-e-d dot. And then the most bizarre thing happened. He realised that he didn't know what to say either, because he'd forgotten about rumours and the power of the word and all of that rot, and the only thing he could think of was the part about the kissing and and and. Good God in heaven, he wanted to kiss Penelope Featherington, Penelope Featherington. He might as well have said he wanted to kiss his sister, except he stole a glance at her. She looked uncommonly fetching, and he wondered how he hadn't noticed that earlier that afternoon she wasn't his sister. She definitely wasn't his sister. Colin, his name was a mere whisper on her lips. Her eyes were quite admirably blinking and befuddled. And how was it he'd never noticed what an intriguing shade of brown they were? Almost gold near the pupil. He'd never seen anything like it. And yet it wasn't as if he hadn't seen her a hundred times before. He stood suddenly, drunkenly. Best if they weren't quite on the same latitude. Harder to see her eyes from up here. She stood. Two. Damn it, Colin, she asked, her voice barely audible. Could I ask you a favour? Call it male intuition. Call it insanity. But a very insistent voice inside of him was screaming that whatever she wanted had to be a very bad idea. He was, however an idiot. He had to be. Because he felt his lips part, and then he heard a voice that sounded an awful lot like his own say. Of course. Her lips puckered, 
and for a moment he thought she was trying to kiss him. But then he realized that she was just bringing them together to form a word, would adjust a word. Nothing but a word beginning with WW always look like a kiss. Would you kiss me? Chapter 9. Every week there seems to be one invitation. That is coveted above all others. And this week's prize must surely go to the Countess of McClesfield, who is hosting a grand ball on Monday night. Lady McClesfield is not a frequent hostess here in London, but she is very popular, as is her husband, and it is expected that a great many bachelors plan to attend, including Mr. Colin Bridgerton assuming he does not collapse from exhaustion. After four days with the ten Bridgerton grandchildren, Viscount Berwick, and Mr. Michael Anstruther Weatherby. This author anticipates that a great many young and unmarried ladies will choose to attend as well. Following the publication of this column, Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 16 April, 1-8-4. His life as he knew it was over, what he, he asked, aware that he was blinking rapidly. Her face turned a deeper shade of crimson than he'd thought humanly possible and she turned away. Never mind, she mumbled. Forget I said anything. Colin thought that a very good idea. But then, just when he'd thought that his world might resume its normal course, or at least that he'd be able to pretend it had, she whirled back around. Her eyes alight with a passionate fire that astonished him. No, I'm not going to forget it, she cried out. I've spent my life forgetting things, not saying them, never telling anyone what I really want. Colin tried to say something, but it was clear to him that his throat had begun to close. Any minute now he'd be dead. He was sure of it. It won't mean a thing, she said. I promise you, it won't mean anything. And I'd never expect anything from you because of it. But I could die tomorrow. And what? Her eyes looked huge and meltingly dark and pleading and he could feel his resolve melting away i'm eight and twenty she said her voice soft and sad i'm an old maid and i've never been kissed go 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 he knew he knew how to speak he was fairly certain he'd been perfectly articulate just minutes earlier but now he didn't seem able to form a word and penelope kept talking her cheeks delightfully pink and her lips moving so quickly that he couldn't help but wonder what they'd feel like on his skin, on his neck, on his shoulder, on his other places. I'm going to be an old maid at nine and twenty, she said, and I'll be an old maid at thirty. I could die tomorrow, and you're not going to die tomorrow. He somehow managed to get out, but I could, I could, and it would kill me, because... You'd already be dead, he said, thinking his voice sounded rather strange and disembodied. I don't want to die without ever having been kissed. She finally finished. Colin could think of a hundred reasons why kissing Penelope Thurings was a very bad idea, the number one being that he actually wanted to kiss her. He opened his mouth, hoping that a sound would emerge and that it might actually be intelligible speech. But there was nothing just the sound of breath on his lips. And then Penelope did the one thing that could break his resolve in an instant. She looked up at him deeply into his eyes and uttered one simple word, please, he was lost. There was something heartbreaking in the way she was gazing at him, as if she might die if he didn't kiss her, not from heartbreak, not from embarrassment. It was almost as if she needed him for nourishment to feed her soul, to fill her heart, and Colin couldn't remember anyone else ever needing him with such fervour dot it humbled him. It made him want her with an intensity that nearly buckled his knees. He looked at her, and somehow he didn't see the woman he'd seen so many times before. She was different, she glowed. She was a siren, a goddess. And he wondered how on earth no one had ever noticed this before. Colin, she whispered. He took a step forward barely a half a foot, but it was close enough so that when he touched her chin and tipped her face up, 
Her lips were mere inches from his, their breath mingled, and the air grew hot and heavy. Penelope was trembling he could feel that under his fingers, but he wasn't so sure. That he wasn't trembling, too, he assumed he'd say something flip and roll. Like the devil-may-care fellow he was reputed to be. Anything for you, perhaps, or maybe, every woman deserves at least one kiss. But as he closed the bare distance between them, he realized that there were no words that could capture the intensity of the moment. No words for the passion, no words for the need, no words for the sheer epiphany of the moment. And so, on an otherwise unremarkable Friday afternoon, in the heart of Mayfair, in a quiet drawing room on Mount Street, Colin Bridget and kissed Penelope, feet Harrington Dot, and it was glorious. His lips touched her softly at first, not because he was trying to be gentle, although if he'd had the presence of mind to think about such things, it probably would have occurred to him that this was her first kiss and it ought to be reverent and beautiful and all the things a girl dreams. About as she's lying in bed at night dots, but in all truth, none of that was on Colin's mind. In fact, he was thinking of quite little. His kiss was soft and gentle because he was still so surprised that he was kissing her. He'd known her for years, had never even thought about touching his lips to hers. And now he couldn't have let her go that the fires of hell were licking his toes. He could barely believe what he was doing or that he wanted to do it so damned much. It wasn't the sort of a kiss one initiates because one is overcome with passion or emotion or anger or desire. It was a slower thing, a learning experience for Colin just as much as for Penelope. And he was learning that everything he thought he'd known about kissing was rubbish. Everything else had been mere lips and tongue and softly murmured. But meaningless words, this was a kiss. There was something in the friction, the way he could hear and feel her breath at the same time. Something in the way she held perfectly still, and yet he could feel her heart pounding through her skin. There was something in the fact that he knew it was her. Colin moved his lips slightly to the left, until he was nipping the corner of her mouth, softly tickling the very spot where her lips joined. His tongue dipped and traced, learning the contours of her mouth. Tasting the sweet salty essence of her dot this was more than a kiss. His hands, which had been lightly splayed against her back, grew rigid. More tense as they pressed into the fabric of her dress. He could feel the heat of her under his fingertips, seeping up through the muslin. Swirling in the delicate muscles of her back, he drew her to him. Pulling her closer, closer, until their bodies were pressed together, he could feel her the entire length of her, and it set him on fire. He was growing hard, and he wanted her dear God, how he wanted her. His mouth grew more insistent, and his tongue darted forward. Nudging her until her lips parted, he swallowed her soft moan of acquiescence, then pushed forward to taste her. She was sweet and a little tart from the lemonade, and she was clearly as intoxicating as fine. Brandy. Because Colin was starting to doubt his ability to remain on his feet, he moved his hands along the length of her slowly, so as not to frighten her. She was soft, curvy, and lush. Just as he'd always thought a woman should be, her hips flared, and her bottom was perfect. And her breasts, good God. Her breasts felt good pressing against his chest, his palms itched to cut them but he forced his hands to remain where they were rather enjoyably on her derriere, so it really wasn't that much of a sacrifice. Beside the fact that he really shouldn't be groping a gently bred lady's breasts in the middle of her drawing room, he had a rather painful suspicion that if he touched her in that way, he would lose himself completely. Penelope, Penelope, he murmured, wondering why her name tasted so good on his lips he was ravenous for her, heady and drugged by passion, and he wanted desperately for her to feel the same way. She felt perfect in his arms, but thus far she had made no reaction. Oh, 
she had swayed in his arms and opened her mouth to welcome his sweet invasion. But other than that, she had done nothing, and yet, from the pant of her breath and the beat of her heart, he knew that she was aroused. He pulled back just a few inches so that he could touch her chin and tilt her face up toward his. Her eyelids fluttered open, revealing eyes that were dazed with passion, perfectly matching her lips, which were lightly parted, completely soft and thoroughly swollen from his kisses. She was beautiful, utterly, completely, soul-stirringly beautiful. He didn't know how he hadn't noticed it. All these years was the world populated with blind men, or merely stupid ones. You can kiss me, too, he whispered, leaning his forehead lightly against hers. She did nothing but blink, a kiss. He murmured, lowering his lips to hers again, although just for a fleeting moment. Her hand stirred at his back. What do I do? she whispered. Whatever you want to do, slowly, tentatively. She lifted one of her hands to his face. Her finger strailed lightly over his cheek, skimming along the line of his jaw until they fell away. Thank you, she whispered. Thank you. He went still dot it was exactly the wrong thing to say. He didn't want to be thanked for his kiss dot it made him feel guilty dot and shallow, as if it had been something done out of pity. And the worst part was he knew that, if all this had come to pass only a few months earlier, it would have been out of pity. What the hell did that say about him? Don't thank me, he said gruffly, shoving himself backward until they were no longer touching. But I said don't. He repeated harshly, turning away as if he couldn't bear the sight of her. When the truth was that he couldn't quite bear himself, and the damnedest thing was he wasn't sure why, this desperate, gnawing feeling was it guilt, because he shouldn't have kissed her, because he shouldn't have liked it, Colin, she said, don't be angry with yourself. I'm not, he snapped, I asked you to kiss me, I practically forced you, now, there was a surefire way to make a man feel manly, you didn't. Force me, he bit off, no, but, for the love of God, Penelope, enough, she drew back, her eyes wide. I'm sorry, she whispered. He looked down at her hands. They were shaking. He closed his eyes in agony. Why, why, why was he being such an ass? Penelope, he began. No. It's all right, she said. Her words rushed. You don't have to say anything. No, I should. I really wish you wouldn't. And now she looked so quietly dignified, which made him feel even. Worse. She was standing there, her hands clasped demurely in front of her. Her eyes downward not quite on the floor, but not on his face. She thought he'd kissed her out of pity. And he was a knave because a small part of him wanted her to think that, because if she thought it, then maybe he could convince himself that it was true, that it was just pity, that it couldn't possibly be more. I should go, he said. The words quiet and yet still too loud in the silent room. She didn't try to stop him. He motioned to the door. I should go, he said again. Even as his feet refused to move, she nodded. I didn't, he started to say, and then, horrified by the words that had nearly come out of his mouth, he actually did head toward the door. But Penelope called out, of course she called out. You didn't what? And he didn't know what to say because what he'd started to say was, I didn't kiss you out of pity, if he wanted her to know that, if he wanted to convince himself of that, then that could only mean that he craved her good opinion, which could only mean, I have to go, he blurted out, desperate now, as if leaving the room might be the only way to keep his thoughts, from travelling down such a dangerous road. He crossed the remaining distance to the door, waiting for her to say something, to call out his name, but she didn't, and he left. And he'd never hated himself more. Colin was in an exceedingly bad mood before the footman showed up at his front door with a summons. From his mother. Afterward, 
He was beyond repair. Bloody hell. She was going to start in on him again about getting married. Her summonses were always about getting married. And he really wasn't in the mood for it right now. But she was his mother and he loved her. And that meant he couldn't very well ignore her. So with considerable grumbling and a fair bit of cursing while he was at it, he yanked on his boots and coat and headed out the door. He was living in Bloomsbury. Not the most fashionable section of town. For a member of the aristocracy, although Bedford Square, where he had taken out a lease on a small but elegant terrace house, was certainly an upscale and respectable address, Colin rather liked living in Bloomsbury, where his neighbours were doctors, and lawyers and scholars and people who actually did things, other than attend party after party. He wasn't ready to trade in his heritage, for a life in trade it was rather good to be a Bridgerton. After all but there was something stimulating about watching professional men go in. About their daily business. The lawyers heading east to the inns of the court, the doctors northwest to Portland Place. It would have been easy enough to drive his curricle across town. It had only been brought back to the mews an hour ago upon his return from the Featheringtons. But Colin was feeling a bit in need of some fresh air not to mention perverse enough to take the slowest means possible to number five, if his mother intended to deliver another lecture. On the virtues of marriage, followed by a lengthy dissertation on the attributes of each and every. Eligible miss in London. She could bloody well wait for him. Colin closed his eyes and groaned. His mood must be worse than even he had thought if he was cursing in relation to his mother whom he and all the Bridgertons really held in the highest esteem and affection. It was Penelope's fault, dot no. It was Eloise's fault, he thought. Grinding his teeth, better to blame a sibling, dot, no he slumped back into his desk chair. Groaning it was his fault. If he was in a bad mood, if he was ready to yank someone's head off with his bare hands, it was his fault. And his fault alone, he shouldn't have kissed Penelope. It didn't matter that he'd wanted to kiss her, even though he hadn't even realised that he wanted to until right before she'd mentioned it. He still shouldn't have kissed her, although, when he really thought about it, he wasn't quite sure. Why he shouldn't have kissed her, he stood, then trudged to the window and let his forehead rest against the pane. Bedford Square was quiet, with only a few men walking along the pavement, labourers, they looked to be. Probably working on the new museum being built just to the east. It was why Colin had taken a house on the west side of the square. The construction could get very noisy. His gaze travelled north. To the statue of Charles James Fox. Now, there was a man with a purpose. Led the Whigs for years. He hadn't always been very well liked. If some of the older members of the ton were to be believed, but Colin was coming to think that perhaps being well-liked was overrated. Heaven knew that no one was better liked than he was. And look at him now. Frustrated and malcontent. Grumpy and ready to lash out at anyone who crossed his path, he sighed. Planting one hand on the window frame and pushing himself back to an upright position. He'd better get going. Especially if he was planning to walk all the way to Mayfair. Although, in truth... It really wasn't that far. Probably not more than thirty minutes if he kept his pace brisk, and he always did. Less if the pavements weren't littered with slow people. It was longer than most members of the ton cared to be outside in London, unless they were shopping, or fashionably strolling in the park. But Colin felt the need to clear his head, and if the air in London wasn't particularly fresh, well, it would still have to do. His luck that day being what it was, however, by the time he reached the intersection of Oxford and Regent Streets, the first splats of raindrops began to dance against his face. By the time he was turning off Hanover Square onto St George Street, it was pouring in earnest, and he was just close enough to Bruton Street that it would have been really ridiculous to have tried to hail a hackney too. To take him the rest of the way, Dot, so he walked on. After the first minute or so of annoyance, however, 
The rain began to feel oddly good. It was warm enough out that it didn't chill him to the bone, and the fat, wet sting of it almost felt like a penance, and he felt like. Maybe that was what he deserved. The door to his mother's house opened before Colin's foot had even found the top step. Wickham must have been waiting for him. Might I suggest a towel? The butler intoned, handing him a large white cloth. Colin took it, wondering how on earth Wickham had had time to get a towel. He couldn't have known that Colin would be fool enough to walk in the rain. Not for the first time it occurred to Colin that butlers must be possessed of strange, mystical powers. Perhaps it was a job requirement. Colin used the towel to dry his hair, causing great consternation to Wickham, who was terribly proper and surely expected Colin to retire to a private room for at least a half an hour to mend his appearance. Where's my mother? Colin asked. Wickham's lips tightened, and he looked pointedly down at Colin's feet, which were now creating small puddles. She's in her office, he replied. But she's speaking with your sister. Which sister? Colin asked, keeping a sunny smile on his face, just to annoy Wickham, who had surely been trying to annoy him, by omitting his sister's name, as if you could simply say your sister to a Bridgerton and expect him to know who you were talking about. Francesca. Ah, oh, yes, she's returning to Scotland soon. Isn't she? Tomorrow. Colin handed the towel back to Wickham, who regarded it as he might a large insect. I won't bother her. Then, just let her know I'm here when she's done with Francesca. Wickham nodded. Would you care to change your clothes? Mr. Bridgerton, I believe we have some of your brother Gregory's garments upstairs in his bedchamber. Colin found himself smiling. Gregory was finishing up his final term at Cambridge. He was eleven years younger than Colin, and it was difficult to believe they could actually share clothing. But he supposed it was time to accept that his little brother had finally grown up. That's an excellent idea, Colin said. He gave his sodden sleeve a rueful glance. I'll leave these here to be cleaned and fetch them later. Wickham nodded again, murmured, As you wish, and disappeared down the hall to parts unknown. Colin took the steps to at a time up to the family quarters. As he slashed down the hall, he heard the sound of a door opening, turning around. He saw that it was Eloise, not the person he wanted to see. She immediately brought back all the memories of his afternoon, with Penelope. Their conversation, the kiss dot especially the kiss, and even worse, the guilt he'd felt afterward, the guilt he still felt, Colin, Eloise said brightly, I didn't realise you what did you do, walk. He shrugged, I like the rain, she eyed him curiously, her head cocking to the side. As it always did when she was puzzling through something, you're in a rather odd mood today. I'm soaking wet, Eloise, no need to snap at me about it, she said with a sniff. I didn't force you to walk across town in the rain, it wasn't raining when I left he felt rather compelled to say. There was something about a sibling that brought out the eight-year-old in a body. I'm sure the sky was grey, she returned, clearly. She had a bit of the eight-year-old in her as well. May we continue this discussion when I'm dry? He asked, his voice deliberately impatient, of course. She said expansively, all accommodation, I'll wait for you right here. Colin took his time, while he changed into Gregory's clothes, taking more care with his cravat than he had in years. Finally, when he was convinced that Eloise must be grinding her teeth, he re-entered the hall. I heard you went to see Penelope today, she said without preamble. Wrong thing to say. Where did you hear that? He asked carefully. He knew that his sister and Penelope were close. But surely Penelope wouldn't have told Eloise about that. Felicity told Hyacinth, and Hyacinth told you, of course, something, Colin muttered, has got to be done about all the gossip in this town. I hardly think this counts as gossip, Colin, Eloise said. 
It's not as if you're interested in Penelope. If she had been talking about any other woman, Colin would have expected her to give him a sidelong glance, followed by a coy, are you? But this was Penelope, and even though Eloise was her very best friend, and thus her finest champion, even she couldn't imagine that a man of Colin's reputation and popularity would be interested in a woman of an Elop's reputation and lack of popularity. Colin's mood shifted from bad to foul. Anyway, Eloise continued, completely oblivious to the thunderstorm that was brewing in her normally sunny and jovial brother. Felicity told Hyacinth that Briley told her that you'd visited. I was just wondering what it was about. It's none of your business, Colin said briskly, hoping she'd leave it at that, but not really believing she would. He took a step toward the stairwell, though, always optimistic. It's about my birthday, isn't it, Eloise guest? Dashing in front of him with such suddenness that his toe crashed into her slipper. She winced, but Colin didn't feel particularly sympathetic. No, it's not about your birthday, he snapped. Your birthday isn't even until, he stopped. Ah, hell, until next week, he grumbled. She smiled slyly, then, as if her brain had just realised it had taken a wrong turn, her lips parted with dismay as she, mentally backed up, and headed in another direction. So, she continued, moving slightly so that she better blocked his path. If you didn't go over there to discuss my birthday, and there's nothing you could say now, that would convince me you did why did you go see Penelope? Is nothing private in this world, not in this family? Colin decided that his best bet was to adopt his usual sunny persona, even though he didn't feel the least bit charitable toward her at the moment, and so he slapped on the smoothest and easiest of his smiles, quirked his head to the side, and asked, Do I hear mother calling my name? I didn't hear a thing, Eloise said pertly. And what is wrong with you? You look very odd. I'm fine. You're not fine. You look as if you've been to the dentist. His voice descended into a mutter. It's always nice to receive compliments from family. If you can't trust your family to be honest with you, she volleyed, who can you trust? He leaned fluidly back against the wall. Crossing his arms, I prefer flattery to honesty. No, you don't. Dear God, he wanted to smack her. He hadn't done that since he waste wealth, and he'd been hoss-whipped for it. The only time he could recall his father laying a hand on him. What I want. Colin returned, arching one brow, is an immediate cessation of this conversation. What you want, Ello is needled. It's for me to stop asking you why you went to see Penelope Featherington. But I think we both know that isn't likely to occur. And that was when he knew it. Knew it deep in his bones, from his head to his toes, his heart to his mind. That his sister was Lady Whistledown, all of the pieces fit. There is no one more stubborn and bullheaded. No one who could or would take the time to get to the bottom of every last piece of gossip. And innuendo. When Eloise wanted something, she didn't stop. Until she had it firmly in her grasp. It wasn't about money, or greed, or material goods. With her, it was about knowledge. She liked knowing things. And she'd needle and needle and needle. Until you told her exactly what she wanted to hear. Dot, it was a miracle no one had found her out. Sooner. Out of nowhere, he said. I need to talk to you. He grabbed her arm and hauled her into the nearest room, which happened to be her own, Colin. She shrieked, trying unsuccessfully to shake him off. What are you doing? He slammed the door shut, let go of her, and crossed his arms. His stance white, his expression menacing. Colin, she repeated, her voice dubious. I know what you've been up to, what I've been, and then, damn her. She started laughing. Eloise, he boomed. I'm talking to you, clearly. She just barely managed to get out. He held his ground. Glaring at her dot, she was looking away. 
nearly doubled over with laughter. Finally, she said, What are you? But then she looked at him again, and even though she tried to keep her mouth shut, she exploded again. If she'd been drinking something, Colin thought without a trace of humour. It would have come out her nose. What the hell is the matter with you? He snapped. That finally got her attention. He didn't know whether it was his tone of voice or maybe his use of profanity. But she sobered in an instant. My word, she said softly. You're serious. Do I look like I'm joking? No, Eloise said. Although you did at first. I'm sorry, Colin. But it's just not like you to be glowering and yelling and all that. You looked rather like Anthony, you, actually, she said, giving him a look that was not nearly as wary as it should have been. You looked more like yourself, trying to imitate Anthony. He was going to kill her, right here in her room, in his mother's house. He was going to commit sororicide, Colin, she asked hesitantly, as if she'd just finally noticed that he had long since passed angry on his way to furious. Sit down. He jerked his head toward a chair. Now. Are you all right? Sit down, he roared, and she did, with alacrity. I can't remember the last time you raised your voice, she whispered. I can't remember the last time I had cause to. What's wrong? He decided he might as well just come out and say it. Colin. I know your lady whistled down. What? There's no use denying it. I've seen. Eloise jumped to her feet. Except that it's not true. Suddenly, he no longer felt quite so angry. Instead he felt tired, old. Eloise, I've seen the proof. What proof? she asked. Her voice rising with disbelief. How can't there be proof of something that isn't true? He grabbed one of her hands. Look at your fingers. She did so. What about them? Ink stains. Her mouth fell open. From that you've deduced that I'm Lady Whistledown. Why are they there, then? You've never used a quill, Eloise. There was a great deal of warning in his voice. I don't have to tell you why I have ink stains on my fingers, he said her name again. I don't, she protested. I owe you no o. Oh, very well. Fine. She crossed her arms mutinously. I write letters. He shot her an extremely disbelieving look. I do. She protested, every day. Sometimes to in a day, when Francesca is away. I'm quite a loyal correspondent, you should know. I've written enough letters with your name on the envelope. Although I doubt half of them ever reached you. Letters, he asked, his voice full of doubt. And derision, for God's sake. Eloise, do you really think that will wash? Who the devil are you writing so many letters to? She blushed, really, truly, deeply blushed. It's none of your business. He would have been intrigued by her reaction if he still weren't so sure that she was lying about being Lady Whistledown. For God's sake, Eloise, he bit off. Who is going to believe that you're writing letters every day? I certainly don't. She glared at him, her dark grey eyes flashing with fury. I don't care what you think. She said in a very low voice, No, that's not true. I am furious that you don't believe me. You're not giving me much to believe in. She stood, walked over to him, and poked him in the chest, hard. You are my brother, she spat out. You should believe me unquestioningly, love me unconditionally. That's what it means to be family, Eloise, he said. Her name coming out really as nothing more than a sigh. Don't try to make excuses now. I wasn't. That's even worse. She stalked to the door. You should be on your hands and knees, begging me for forgiveness. He hadn't thought he had it in him. To smile, but somehow that did it for him. Now, that doesn't really seem. In keeping with my character, does it? She opened her mouth to say something, but the sound that came out was not precisely English. All she managed was something along the lines of, ooh, ooh, in an extremely irate voice, and then she stormed out, slamming the door behind her. Colin slouched into a chair. 
wondering when she'd realized that she'd left him in her own bedchamber. The irony was, he reflected, possibly the only bright spot in an otherwise miserable day. Chapter 10 Dear Reader Chapter 10 It is with a surprisingly sentimental heart that I write these words. After eleven years of chronicling the lives and times of the Beaumont, this author is putting down her pen. Although Lady Danbury's challenge was surely the catalyst for the retirement, in truth the blame cannot be placed entirely upon that countess's shoulders. The column has grown wearisome of late, less fulfilling to write, and perhaps less entertaining to read. This author needs a change. It is not so difficult to fathom. Eleven years is a long time. And in truth, the recent renewal of interest in this author's identity has grown disturbing. Friends are turning against friends. Brothers against sisters, all in the futile attempt to solve an unsolvable secret. Furthermore, the sleuthing of the ton has grown downright dangerous. Last week, it was Lady Blackwood's twisted ankle. This week's injury apparently belongs to Hyacinth Bridgerton, who was slightly hurt at Saturday's soiree held at the London home of Lord and Lady Riverdale. It has not escaped this author's notice that Lord Riverdale is Lady Danbury's nephew. Miss Hyacinth must have suspected someone in attendance, because she sustained her injuries while falling into the library after the door was opened, while she had her ear pressed up to the wood. Listening at doors, chasing down delivery boys, and these are only the tidbits that have reached this author's ears. What has London society come to? This author assures you, dear reader, that she never once listened at a door in all eleven years of her career. All gossip in this column was come by fairly, with no tools or tricks other than keen eyes and ears. I bid you au revoir, London. It has been a pleasure to serve you. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 19 April, 1-8-4. It was, not surprisingly, the talk of the McClesfield Ball. Lady Whistledown has retired. Can you believe it? What will I read with my breakfast? How will I know what happened? If I miss a party, we'll never find out who she is now. Lady Whistledown has retired. One woman fainted. Nearly cracking her head against the side of a table yet, she slumped gracelessly to the floor. Apparently, she had not read that morning's column, and thus heard the news for the first time right there at the McClesfield Ball. She was revived by smelling salts, but then quickly swooned again. She's a faker. Hyacinth Bridgerton muttered to Felicity Featherington as they stood in a small group with the Dowager Lady Bridgerton and Penelope. Penelope was officially attending as Felicity's chaperone due to their mother's decision to remain. Home. With an upset stomach, the first faint was real. Hyacinth explained, anyone could tell that by the clumsy way she fell, but this. Her hand flicked toward the lady on the floor. With a gesture of disgust, no one swoons like a ballet dancer not even ballet dancers. Penelope had overheard the entire conversation, as Hyacinth was directly to her left, and so she murmured, Have you ever swooned? All the while keeping her eyes on the unfortunate woman, who was now coming awake with a delicate fluttering of eyelashes as the smelling salts, were once again wafted under her nose. Absolutely not. Hyacinth replied, with no small measure of pride, Swoons are for the tender-hearted and foolish. She added, And if Lady Whistledown were still writing, mark my words, she would say the exact same thing in her next column. Alas, there are no words to mark any more. Felicity answered with a sad sigh. Lady Bridgerton agreed. It's the end of an era, she said. I feel quite bereft without her. Well, it's not as if we've had to go more than 18 hours without her yet, Penelope felt compelled to point out. We did receive a column this morning. What is there yet to feel bereft about? It's the principle of it, Lady Bridgerton said with a sigh. If this were an ordinary Monday, 
I would know that I'd receive a new report on Wednesday. But now, Felicity actually sniffled. Now we're lost, she said. Penelope turned to her sister in disbelief. Surely you're being a little melodramatic. Felicity's overblown shrug was worthy of the stage. Am I? Am I? Hyacinth gave her a sympathetic pat on the back. I don't think you are. Felicity, I feel precisely the same way. It's only a gossip column, Penelope said, looking around for any sign of sanity in her companions. Surely they realised that the world was not drawing to a close. Just because Lady Whistledown had decided to end her career. You're right, of course, said Lady Bridgerton, jutting her chin out and pursing her lips in a manner that was probably supposed to convey an air of practicality. Thank you for being the voice of reason for our little party. But then she seemed to deflate. Slightly, and she said. But I must admit, I'd grown rather used to having her out. Whoever she is, Penelope decided it was well past time to change the topic. Where is Eloise this evening? Ill, I'm afraid. A headache, Lady Bridgerton said, small frowns of worry creasing her otherwise unlined face. She hasn't been feeling the thing for almost a week now. I'm starting to grow concerned about her. Penelope had been staring rather aimlessly at a scance on the wall, but her attention was immediately brought back to Lady Bridgerton. It's nothing serious, I hope. It's nothing serious, Hyacinth answered. Before her mother could even open her mouth, Eloise never gets sick, which is precisely why I'm worried, Lady Bridgerton said. She hasn't been eating very well, that's not true, Hyacinth said. Just this afternoon, Wickham brought up a very heavy tray. Scones and eggs and I think I smelled gammon steak. She gave an arch look to no one in particular. And when Eloise left the tray out in the hall, it was completely empty. Hyacinth Bridgerton, Payne Alo. Pay decided. Had a surprisingly good I-4 detail. She's been in a bad mood. Hyacinth continued, since she quarrelled with Colin. She quarrelled with Colin, Penelope asked. An awful feeling beginning to roil her stomach, when, sometime last week, Hyacinth said. When, Penelope wanted to scream. But surely it would look odd if she demanded an exact day. Was it Friday? Was it? Penelope would always remember, but her first, and most probably only, kiss had occurred on a Friday dot. She was strange that way. She always remembered the days of the week. She'd met Colin on a Monday. She'd kissed him on a Friday. Twelve years later, she sighed. It seemed fairly pathetic. Is something wrong, Penelope? Lady Bridgerton asked. Penelope looked at Eloise's mother. Her blue eyes were kind and filled with concern. And there was something about the way. She tilted her head to the side that made Penelope want to cry. She was getting far too emotional these days, crying over the tilt of her head. I'm fine. She said, hoping that her smile looked true. I'm just worried about Eloise. Hyacinth snorted. Dot Penelope decided she needed to make her escape. All these Bridgertons, well, two of them, anyway, were making her think of Colin, which wasn't anything she hadn't been doing nearly. Every minute of the day for the past three days, but at least that had been in private, where she could sigh and moan and grumble to her heart's content. But this must have been her lucky night, because just then she heard Lady Danbury barking her name. What was her world coming to? that she considered herself lucky to be trapped in a corner with London's most acerbic tongue. But Lady Danbury would provide the perfect excuse to leave her current little quartet of ladies. And besides, she was coming to realise that in a very odd way, she rather liked Lady Danbury, Miss Featherington, Miss Featherington. Felicity instantly took a step away. I think she means you. She whispered urgently, of course she means me, Penelope said, with just a touch of hauteur. I consider Lady Danbury a cherished friend. Felicity's eyes bugged out. You do, Miss. Featherington, Lady Danbury said. 
thumping her cane an inch away from Penelope's foot. As soon as she reached her side, not you, she said to Felicity. Even though Felicity had done nothing more than smile politely, as the countess had approached, you, she said to Penelope, ah, good evening, Lady Danbury. Penelope said, which she considered an admirable number of words under the circumstances. I have been looking for you all evening, Lady D announced. Penelope found that a trifle surprising. You have, yes, I want to talk with you about that whistle-down woman's last column. Me, yes, you, Lady Danbury grumbled. I'd be happy to talk with someone else if you could find me a body with more than half a brain. Penelope choked on the beginnings of laughter, as she motioned to her companions. Ah, uh, I assure you that Lady Bridgerton. Lady Bridgerton was furiously shaking her head. She's too busy trying to get that oversized brood of hers married off, Lady Danbury announced. Can't be expected to know how to conduct a decent conversation these days. Penelope stole a frantic glance over at Lady Bridgerton to see if she was upset by the insult after all. She had been trying to marry off her oversized brood for a decade now. But Lady Bridgerton didn't look the least bit upset. In fact, she appeared to be stifling laughter. Stifling laughter and inching away. Taking Hyacinth and Felicity with her. Sneaky little traitors. Are, well, Penelope shouldn't complain. She'd wanted an escape from the Bridgertons, hadn't she? but she didn't particularly enjoy having Felicity. And Hyacinth think they'd somehow pulled one over on her. They're gone now, Lady Danbury cackled. And a good thing it is, too. Those two gels haven't an intelligent thing to say between them. Oh, now. That isn't true, Penelope felt compelled to protest. Felicity and Hyacinth are both very bright. I never said they weren't smart, Lady D replied acidly. Just that they haven't an intelligent thing to say. But don't worry, she added. Giving Penelope a reassuring reassuring. Whoever heard of Lady Danbury being reassuring? Pat on the arm. It's not their fault that their conversation is useless. They'll grow out of it. People are like fine wines. If they start off good, they only get better with age. Penelope had actually been glancing slightly to the right of Lady Danbury's face, peering over her shoulder at a man who she thought might be Colin, but wasn't, but this brought her attention back to where the Countess wanted it. Fine wines, Penelope echoed, HMMPH. And here I thought you weren't listening. No, of course I was listening. Penelope felt her lips tugging into, Something that wasn't quite a smile. I was just distracted. Looking for that Bridgerton boy, no doubt. Penelope gasped, dot double quotes, oh, don't look so shocked. It's written all over your face. I'm just surprised he hasn't noticed. I imagine he has. Has he? Humph, Lady Danbury frowned, the corners of her mouth, spilling into long vertical wrinkles on either side of her chin doesn't speak well of him that he hasn't done anything about it. Penelope's heart ached. There was something oddly sweet about the old lady's faith in her. As if men like Colin fell in love with women like Penelope. On a regular basis, Penelope had had to beg him to kiss her, for heaven's sake. And look how that had ended up. He'd left the house in a fit of temper, and they hadn't spoken for three days. Well, don't worry over him, Lady Danbury said quite suddenly. We'll find you someone else, Penelope delicately cleared her throat. Lady Danbury, have you made me your project? The old lady beamed, her smile a bright and glowing streak in her wrinkled face. Of course. I'm surprised it has taken you so long to figure it out. But why? Penelope asked. Truly unable to fathom it, Lady Danbury sighed. The sound wasn't sad more wistful, really. Would you mind if we sat down for a spell? These old bones aren't what they used to be. Of course, Penelope said quickly, feeling terrible that she'd never once considered Lady Danbury's age. As they stood there in the stuffy ballroom, 
but the Countess was so vibrant. It was difficult to imagine her ailing or weak. Here we are, Penelope said, taking her arm and leading her to a nearby chair. Once Lady Danbury was settled, Penelope took a seat beside her. Are you more comfortable now? Would you like something to drink? Lady Danbury nodded gratefully, and Penelope signalled to a footman to bring them to glasses of lemonade. Since she didn't want to leave the Countess, while she was looking so pale, I'm not as young as I used to be, Lady Danbury told her once the footman had hired off to the refreshment table. None of us are, Penelope replied. It could have been a flip comment, but it was spoken with wry warmth. And somehow Penelope thought that Lady Danbury would appreciate the sentiment. She was right. Lady D chuckled and sent Penelope an appreciative glance before saying, The older I get, the more I realise that most of the people in this world are fools. You're only just figuring that out now, Penelope asked not to mock, but rather because, given Lady Danbury's usual demeanour, it was difficult to believe that she hadn't reached that conclusion years ago, Lady Danbury. Laughed heartily, no, sometimes I think I knew that before I was born. What I'm realising now is that it's time I did something about it. What do you mean? I couldn't care less what happens to the fools of this world. But the people like you, lacking a handkerchief, she dabbed at her eyes with her fingers. Well, I'd like to see you settled. For several seconds, Penelope did nothing but stare at her. Lady Danbury, she said carefully, I very much appreciate the gesture and the sentiment. But you must know that I am not your responsibility. Of course I know that. Lady Danbury scoffed. Have no fear. I feel no responsibility to you, if I did. This wouldn't be half so much fun. Penelope knew she sounded the various ninny. But all she could think to say was, I don't understand. Lady Danbury held silence while the footman returned with their lemonade. Then began speaking once she had taken several small sips. I like you, Miss Featherington. I don't like a lot of people. It's as simple as that. And I want to see you happy, but I am happy. Penelope said, more out of reflex than anything else. Lady Danbury raised one arrogant brow and expression, that she did to perfection. Are you? she murmured. Was she? What did it mean? That she had to stop and think about the answer. She wasn't unhappy, of that she was sure. She had wonderful friends. A true confidant in her younger sister Felicity, and if her mother and older sisters weren't women, she'd have chosen as close friends well. She still loved them, and she knew they loved her. Hers wasn't such a bad lot. Her life lacked drama and excitement, but she was content. But contentment wasn't the same thing as happiness, and she felt a sharp, stabbing pain in her chest as she realised that she could not answer Lady Danbury's softly worded question. In the affirmative, I've raised my family, Lady Danbury said, four children, and they all married well. I even found a bride for my nephew, who, truth be told, she leaned in and whispered the last three words, giving Penelope the impression that she was about to divulge a state secret. I like better than my own children, Penelope couldn't help but smile. Lady Danbury looked so furtive, so naughty. It was rather cute. Actually, it may surprise you, Lady Danbury continued, but by nature I am a bit of a meddler. Penelope kept her expression scrupulously even. I find myself at loose ends, Lady Danbury said, holding up her hands as if in surrender. I'd like to see one last person happily settled before I go. Don't talk that way, Lady Danbury, Penelope said. Impulsively reaching out and taking her hand, she gave it a little squeeze. You'll outlive us all. I am certain. Pfft, don't be silly. Lady Danbury's tone was dismissive. But she made no move to remove her hand from Penelope's grasp. I'm not being depressive. She added, I'm just realistic. I've passed 70 years of age, and I'm not going to tell you 
how many years ago that was. I haven't much time left in this world, and that doesn't bother me one bit. Penelope hoped she would be able to face her own mortality with the same equanimity. But I like you, Miss Featherington. You remind me of myself. You're not afraid to speak your mind. Penelope could only look at her in shock. She'd spent the last ten years of her life never quite saying what she wanted to say. With people she knew well she was open and honest. And even sometimes a little funny. But among strangers her tongue was quite firmly tied. She remembered a masquerade ball she'd once attended. She'd attended many masquerade balls, actually. But this one had been unique, because she'd actually found a costume nothing special. Just a gown styled as if from the 1600s in, which she'd truly felt her identity was hidden. It had probably been the mask. It was overly large and covered almost all of her face. She had felt transformed suddenly free of the burden of being Penelope Featherington. She felt a new personality coming to the fore. It wasn't as if she had been putting on false airs. Rather, it was more like her true self, the one she didn't know how to show to anyone. She didn't know well, had finally broken loose. She'd laughed, she'd joked, she'd even flirted. And she'd sworn that the following night, when the costumes were all put away, and she was once again attired in her finest evening dress. She'd remember how to be herself, but it hadn't happened. She'd arrived at the ball and she'd nodded and smiled politely, and once again found herself standing near the perimeter of the room, quite literally a wallflower. It seemed that being Penelope Featherington meant something. Her lot had been cast years ago. During that first awful season, when her mother had insisted she make her debut. Even though Penelope had begged otherwise, the pudgy girl, the awkward girl, the one always, dressed in colours, that didn't suit her. It didn't matter that she'd slimmed and grown graceful, and finally thrown out all of her yellow dresses. In this world, the world of London society and the ton, she would always be the same old Penelope, Feet Harrington dot it was her own fault, just as much as anyone else's. A vicious circle, really. Every time Penelope stepped into a ballroom and she saw all those people who had known her for so long, she felt herself folding up inside, turning into the shy, awkward girl of years gone past, rather than the self, assured woman she liked to think she'd become. At least in her heart, Miss Featherington, came Lady Danbury's soft and surprisingly gentle voice, is something wrong. Penelope knew she took longer than she should have to reply, but somehow she needed a few seconds to find her voice. I don't think I know how to speak my mind. She finally said, turning to look at Lady Danbury only as she uttered the final words of the sentence, I never know what to say to people. You know what to say to me. You're different. Lady Danbury threw her head back and laughed. If ever there was an understatement. Oh, Penelope, I hope you don't mind if I call you by your given name if you can speak your mind to me. You can speak it to anyone. Half the grown men in this room run cowering into corners the minute they see me coming. They just don't know you, Penelope said. Patting her on the hand. And they don't know you, either. Lady Danbury quite pointedly replied, No, Penelope said, a touch of resignation in her voice. They don't. I'd say that it was their loss, but that would be rather cavalier of me, Lady Danbury said. Not to them, but to you. Because as often as I call them all fools and I do call them fools often, as I'm sure you know, some of them are actually rather decent people, and it's a crime they haven't gotten to know you. I-H-M-M-M. I wonder what is going on. Penelope found herself, unaccountably, sitting up a little. Straighter. She asked Lady Danbury, What do you mean? But it was clear that something was afoot. People were whispering and motioning to the small days where the musicians were seated. You there, Lady Danbury said, poking her cane into the hip of a nearby gentleman. What is going on? 
Cressida Twombly wants to make some sort of announcement, he said, then quickly stepped away, presumably to avoid any further conversation with Lady Danbury or her. Kane. I hate Cressida Twombly, Penelope muttered. Lady Danbury choked on a bit of laughter. And you say you don't know how to speak your mind. Don't keep me in suspense. Why do you detest her so? Penelope shrugged. She's always behaved quite badly toward me. No, please, Lady Danbury said. Do go on, Penelope sighed. It's nothing, really. Just that I've noticed that people don't often rush to another's defence. Cressida was popular. At least with a certain set and she was rather frightening to the other girls our age. No one dared go against her. Well, almost no one. That got Lady Danbury's attention. And she smiled. Who was your champion? Penelope, champions. Actually, Penelope replied. The Bridgertons always came to my aid. Anthony Bridgerton once gave her the cut direct and took me in to dinner and her voice rose with remembered excitement. He really shouldn't have done so. It was a formal dinner party and he was supposed to escort in some marchioness, I think, she sighed, treasuring the memory. He's a good man. That Anthony Bridgerton, Penelope nodded. His wife told me that that was the day she fell in love with him when she saw him being my hero. Lady Danbury smiled. And has the younger Mr. Bridgerton ever rushed to your aid? Colin, you mean? Penelope didn't even wait for Lady Danbury's nod before adding, of course. Although never with quite so much drama, but I must say, as nice as it is that the Bridgertons are so supportive, what is it? Penelope, Lady Danbury asked. Penelope sighed again. It seemed a nightfall size. I just wish they didn't have to defend me so often. You'd think I could defend myself. Or at least comport myself in such a manner. So that no defending was necessary, Lady Danbury patted her hand. I think you get on a great deal better than you think you do. And as for that Cressida Twombly, Lady Danbury's face soured with distaste. Well, she got her just desserts, if you ask me. Although, she added sharply, people don't ask me as often as they should. Penelope could not quite suppress a little snort of laughter. Look where she is now, Lady Danbury said sharply. Widowed and without even a fortune to show for it. She married that old lecher Horace Twombly, and it turned out he'd managed to fool everyone into, thinking he had money. Now she has nothing but fading good looks. Honesty compelled Penelope to say, she's still quite attractive, HMMPH. If you like flashy women, Lady Danbury's eyes narrowed. There is something far too obvious about that woman. Penelope looked toward the days, where Cressida was waiting, standing there with a surprising amount of patience while the ballroom quieted down. I wonder what she's going to say. Nothing that could possibly interest me. Lady Danbury retorted, i.e. oh, she stopped, and her lips curved into the oddest of expressions. A little bit frown, a little bit smile, what is it? Penelope asked. She craned her neck to try to see Lady Danbury's line of vision, but a rather portly gentleman was blocking her way. Your Mr. Bridgerton is approaching, Lady Danbury said, the smile edging out the frown. And he looks quite determined. Penelope immediately twisted her head around. For the love of God, girl, don't look. Lady Danbury exclaimed, jamming her elbow into Penelope's upper arm. He'll know you're interested. I don't think there's much of a chance. He hasn't figured that out already, Penelope mumbled. And then there he was, standing splendidly in front of her, looking like some handsome god, deigning to grace earth with his presence. Lady Danbury, he said, executing a smooth and graceful bow, Miss Featherington, Mr. Bridgerton, Lady Danbury said, how nice to see you, Colin looked to Penelope, Mr. Bridgerton, she murmured, not knowing what else to say, what did one say to a man one had recently kissed, Penelope certainly had no experience in that area, 
not to mention the added complication of his storming out of the house once they were through. I'd hoped, Colin began, then stopped and frowned, looking up toward the days. What is everyone looking at? Cressida Twombly has some sort of announcement, Lady Danbury said. Colin's face slid into a vaguely annoyed frown. Can't imagine what she has to say that I'd want to listen to, he muttered. Penelope couldn't help but grin. Cressida Twombly was considered a leader in society. Or at least she had been when she'd been young and unmarried. But the Bridgertons had never liked her. And somehow that had always made Penelope feel a little better. Just then a trumpet bled. And the room fell silent as everyone turned their attention to the Earl of Macclesfield, who was standing on the dais next to Cressida. Looking vaguely uncomfortable with all the attention, Penelope smiled. She'd been told the Earl had once been a terrible rake, but now he was a rather scholarly sort, devoted to his family. He was still handsome enough to be. A rake, though. Almost as handsome as Colin, but only almost. Penelope knew she was biased, but it was difficult to imagine any creature quite as magnetically good-looking as Colin. When he was smiling, Good evening, the Earl said loudly. Good evening to you. Came a drunken shout from the back of the room. The Earl gave a good-natured nod, a tolerant half-smile playing along his lips. My, uh, esteemed guest here, he motioned to Cressida, would like to make an announcement so if you would all give your attention to the lady beside me. I give you Lady Twombly. A low ripple of whispers spread across the room as Cressida stepped forward, nodding regally at the crowd. She waited for the room to fall into stark silence. And then she said, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time out of your festivities. To lend me your attention, hurry up with it, someone shouted probably the same person who had yelled good evening to the Earl. Cressida ignored the interruption. I have come to the conclusion that I can no longer continue the deception that has ruled my life. For the last eleven years, the ballroom was rocked with the low buzz of whispers. Everyone knew what she was going to say, and yet no one could believe it was actually true. Therefore, Cressida continued, her voice growing in volume. I have decided to reveal my secret, ladies and gentlemen. I am Lady Whistledown. Chapter 11 Colin couldn't remember the last time he'd entered a ballroom. With quite so much apprehension, the last few days had not been among his best. He'd been in a bad mood, which had only been worsened by the fact that he was rather renowned for his good humour. Which meant that, Everyone had felt compelled to comment on his foul disposition. There was nothing worse for a bad mood than being subjected to constant queries of Why are you in such a bad mood? His family had stopped asking that he'd actually snarled snarled. At Hyacinth, when she'd asked him to accompany her to the theatre the following week, Colin hadn't even been aware that he knew how to snarl. He was going to have to apologise to Hyacinth which was going to be a chore, since Hyacinth never accepted apologies gracefully. At least not those that came from fellow Bridgertons. But Hyacinth was the least of his problems, Colin groaned. His sister wasn't the only person who deserved his apology. And that was why his heart was beating with this strange, nervous, and completely unprecedented rapidity. As he entered the McClesfield ballroom, Penelope would be here. He knew she'd be here because she always attended the major balls. Even if she was now most often doing so as her sister's chaperone, there was something quite humbling in feeling nervous about seeing Penelope. Penelope was Penelope. It was almost as if she'd always been there, smiling politely at the perimeter of a ballroom, and he'd taken her for granted. In a way, some things didn't change, and Penelope was one of them. Except she had changed. Colin didn't know when it had happened. Or even if anyone other than himself had noticed it. But Penelope Featherington was not the same woman he used to know, 
or maybe she was, and he had changed, which made him feel even worse, because if that was the case, then Penelope had been interesting and lovely, and kissable years ago, and he hadn't the maturity to notice. No, better to think that Penelope had changed. Colin had never been a great fan of self flagellation. Whatever the case, he needed to make his apology. And he needed to do it soon. He had to apologize for the kiss. Because she was a lady and he was most of the time, at least a gentleman. And he had to apologize for behaving like a raving idiot. Afterward, because it was simply the right thing to do. God only knew what Penelope thought he thought of her now. It wasn't difficult to find her once he entered the ballroom. He didn't bother to look among the dancing couples, which angered him. Why didn't the other men think to ask her to dance? Rather, he focused his attention along the walls, and sure enough, there she was, seated on a long bench next to O, oh, God Lady Danbury. Well, there was nothing else to do but walk right up. The way Penelope and the old busybody were clutching each other's hands. He couldn't expect Lady Danbury to disappear any time soon. When he reached the pair of ladies, he turned first to Lady Danbury and swept into an elegant bow. Lady Danbury, he said. Before turning his attention to Penelope, Miss Featherington, Mr. Bridgerton, Lady Danbury, said, with a surprising lack of sharpness in her voice, how nice to see you, he nodded, then looked to Penelope, wondering what she was thinking, and whether he'd be able to see it in her eyes. But whatever she was thinking or feeling, it but was hidden under a rather thick layer of nervousness. Or maybe the nervousness was all she was feeling. He couldn't really blame her. The way he'd stormed out of her drawing room, without an explanation. She had to feel confused and it was his experience that confusion invariably led to apprehension. Mr. Bridgerton, she, finally murmured, her entire bearing scrupulously polite, he cleared his throat. How to extract her from Lady Danbury's clutches? He'd really rather not humble himself in front of the nosy old countess, I'd hoped. He began, intending to say that he'd hoped to have a private word with Penelope, Lady Danbury would be ferociously curious, but there was really no other course of action, and it would probably do her good to be left in the dark for once. But just as his lips were forming his query, he realised that something strange was afoot in the McClasfield ballroom. People were whispering and pointing toward the small orchestra, whose members had recently laid their instruments down. Furthermore, Neither Penelope nor Lady Danbury were paying him the least attention. What is everyone looking? At, Colin asked. Lady Danbury didn't even bother looking back at him. As she replied, Cressida Twombly has some sort of announcement. How annoying. He'd never liked Cressida. She'd been mean and petty when she was Cressida Cowper, and she was meaner and pettier as Cressida. Twombly. But she was beautiful, and she was intelligent, in a rather cruel sort of way, and so she was still considered a leader in certain society circles. Can't imagine what she has to say, that I'd want to listen to, Colin muttered. He spied Penelope T.R. Ying to stifle a smile, and flashed her an eye caught, you sort of look. But it was the sort of eye caught you look, that also said, and I agree completely, Good evening, came the loud voice of the Earl of McClasfield. Good evening to you, replied some drunken fool in the back. Colin twisted to see who it was. But the crowd had grown to thick, the Earl spoke some more, then Cressida opened her mouth, at which points Colin ceased paying attention. Whatever Cressida had to say, it wasn't going to help him solve his main problem. Figuring out exactly how he was going to apologise to Penelope. He'd tried rehearsing the words in his mind, but they never sounded quite right. And so he was hoping his famously glib tongue would lead him in the right direction when the time came. Surely she'd understand. Whistle down. Colon only caught the last word of Cressida's monologue. 
but there was no way he could have missed the massive collective indrawn breath that swept the ballroom, followed by the flurry of harsh, urgent whispers one generally only hears after someone is caught in a very embarrassing, very public compromising position. What? He blurted out, turning to Penelope, who'd gone white as a sheet. What did she say? But Penelope was speechless. He looked to Lady Danbury, but the old lady had her hand over her myth and looked as if she might possibly swoon, which was somewhat alarming, as Colin would have bet large sums of money that Lady Danbury had never once swooned in all of her seventy todgers. What? he demanded again, hoping one of them would break free of her stupor. It can't be true. Lady Danbury finally whispered, her mouth slack even as she spoke the words, I don't believe it. What? she pointed toward Cressida, her extended index finger quivering in the flickering candlelight. That lady is not Lady Whistledown. Colin's head snapped back and forth, to Cressida, to Lady Danbury, to Cressida, to Penelope. She's Lady Whistledown, he finally blurted out. So she says, Lady Danbury replied. Doubt written all over her face. Cole intended to agree with her. Cressida Twombly was the last person he'd have pegged as Lady Whistledown. She was smart. There was no denying that, but she wasn't clever, and she wasn't terribly witty, unless she was poking fun at others. Lady Whistledown had a rather cutting sense of humour, but with the exception of her infamous comments on fashion, she never seemed to pick on the less popular members of society. Dot, when all was said and done, Colin had to say that Lady Whistledown had rather good taste in people. I can't believe this, Lady Danbury said with a loud snort of disgust. If I had dreamed this would happen, I would never have made that beastly challenge. This is horrible, Penelope whispered, her voice was quavering. And it made Colin uneasy. Are you all right? he asked. She shook her head. No, I don't think I am. I feel rather ill. Actually, do you want to leave? Penelope shook her head again. But I'll sit right here. If you don't mind, of course, he said, keeping a concerned eye on her. She was still terribly pale, oh, for the love of. Lady Danbury blasphemed, which took Colin by surprise, but then she actually swore, which she thought might very well have tilted the planet on its axis. Lady Danbury, he asked, gaping. She's coming this way, she muttered, jerking her head to the right. I should have known. I'd not escape. Colin looked to his left. Cressida was trying to make her way through the crowd, presumably to confront Lady Danbury and collect her prize. She was, naturally, being accosted at every turn by fellow partygoers. She seemed to be reveling in the attention, no big surprise there. Cressida had always reveled in attention, but she also seemed rather determined to reach Lady Danbury's side. There's no way to avoid her. I'm afraid. Colin said to Lady Danbury. I know, she grumbled. I've been trying to avoid her for years, and I've never succeeded. I thought I was so clever. She looked to Colin. Shaking her head with disgust, I thought it would be such fun to rout out Lady Whistledown. Uh, well, it was fun, Colin said, not really meaning it. Lady Danbury jabbed him in the leg with her cane. It's not the least bit fun, you foolish boy. Now look what I have to do. She waved the cane toward Cressida, who was drawing ever closer. I never dreamed I'd have to deal with the likes of her. Lady Danbury, Cressida said, swishing to a stop in front of her. How nice to see you. Lady Danbury had never been known for her pleasantries, but even she outdid herself by skipping any pretense of a greeting before snapping. I suppose you're here to try to collect your money. Cressida cocked her head to the side in a very pretty, very practised manner. You did say you would give a thousand pounds. To whomever unmasked Lady Whistledown, she shrugged, lifting her hands in the air, and then twisting them gracefully. 
until her palms were up in a gesture of false humility. You never stipulated that I couldn't unmask myself. Lady Danbury rose to her feet, narrowed her eyes, and said, I don't believe it's you. Colin liked to think that he was rather suave and unflappable. But even he gasped at that. Cressida's blue eyes blazed with fury. But she quickly regained control of her emotions and said, I would be shocked if you did not behave with a degree of scepticism. Lady Danbury, after all, it is not your way to be trusting and gentle. Lady Danbury smiled, well, perhaps not a smile. But her lips did move. I shall take that as a compliment, she said, and allow you to tell me that you meant it as such. Colin watched the stalemate with interest and, with a growing sense of alarm, until Lady Danbury turned quite suddenly to Penelope, who had risen to her feet mere seconds after she had. What do you think, Miss Featherington? Lady Danbury asked. Penelope visibly started, her entire body jerking slightly as she stammered. What? I, I beg your pardon. What do you think? Lady Danbury persisted. Is Lady Twombly? Lady whistled down. I am sure I don't know. Oh, come, now, Miss Featherington. Lady Danbury planted her hands on her hips and looked at Penelope with an expression that bordered on exasperation. Surely you have an opinion on the matter. Colin felt himself stepping forward. Lady Danbury had no right to speak to Penelope in such a manner, and furthermore, he didn't like the expression on Penelope's face. She looked trapped, like a fox in a hunt, her eyes darting to him. But this kind of attention, with everyone staring at her and awaiting the marist word from her lips, she was miserable. Miss Featherington, Colin said smoothly, moving to her side, you look unwell. Would you like to leave? Yes, she said. But then something strange happened. She changed. He didn't know how else to describe it. She simply changed, right there, in the McClesfield ballroom, by his side. Penelope Featherington became someone else, her spine stiffened, and he could swear the heat from her body increased, and she said. Lady Danbury smiled. Penelope looked straight at the old countess and said, I don't think she's Lady Whistledown. I think she's lying. Colin instinctively pulled Penelope a little closer to his side. Cressida looked as if she might go. For her throat, I've always liked Lady Whistledown. Penelope said, her chin rising until her bearing was almost regal. She looked to Cressida, and their eyes caught as she added, and it would break my heart if she turned out to be someone. Like Lady Twombly, Colin took her hand and squeezed it. He couldn't help himself. Well said, Miss Featherington, Lady Danbury exclaimed, clapping her hands together in delight. That is exactly what I was thinking, but I couldn't find the words. She turned to Colin with a smile. She's very clever. You know, I know, he replied. A strange, new pride brimming within him. Most people don't notice it, Lady Danbury said, twisting so that her words were directed to, and probably only heard by Colin. I know, he murmured, but I do. He had to smile at Lady Danbury's behaviour, which he was certain, was chosen in part to annoy the devil out of Cressida, who did not like to be ignored. I will not be insulted by that, by that nothing, Cressida fumed. She turned to Penelope with a seething glare and hissed. I demand an apology. Penelope just nodded slowly and said, That is your prerogative. And then she said nothing more. Colin had to physically wipe the smile from his face. Cressida clearly wanted to say more and perhaps commit an act of violence while she was at it, but she held back, presumably because it was obvious that Penelope was among friends. She had always been renowned for her poise, however, and thus Colin was not surprised when she composed herself, turned to Lady Danbury, and said, What do you plan to do about the thousand pounds? Lady Danbury looked at her for the longest. Second, 
Colin had ever endured. Then she turned to him, dear God. The last thing he wanted to do was get involved in this disaster and asked, And what do you think? Mr. Bridgerton, is Our Lady Twombly telling the truth? Colin gave her a practiced smile. You must be mad if you think I'm going to offer an opinion. You're a surprisingly wise man, Mr. Bridgerton, Lady Danbury said approvingly. He nodded modestly. Then ruined the effect by saying, I pride myself on it. But what the hell? It wasn't every day a man was called wise by Lady Danbury. Most of her adjectives, after all, were of the decidedly negative variety. Cressida didn't even bother to bat her eyelashes at him. As Colin had already reflected, she wasn't stupid, just mean. And after a dozen years out in society, she had to know that he didn't much like her, and certainly wasn't about to fall prey to her charms. Instead, she looked squarely at Lady Danbury and kept her voice evenly modulated as she asked, What shall we do now, my lady? Lady Danbury's lips pursed together until she almost appeared mouthless, then she said, I need proof. Cressida blinked, I beg your pardon, proof. Lady Danbury's cane slammed against the floor with remarkable force. Which letter of the word did you not understand? I'm not handing over a king's ransom without proof. One thousand pounds is hardly a king's ransom, Cressida said. Her expression growing petulant dot, Lady Danbury's eyes narrowed. Then why are you so keen to get it? Cressida was silent for a moment, but there was a tightness in everything about her, her stance. Her posture, the line of her jaw. Everyone knew that her husband had left her in bad financial straits, but this was the first time anyone had hinted as such to her face. Get me proof, Lady Danbury said and I'll give you the money, are you saying?" Cressida said. And even as he despised her, Colin was forced to admire her ability to keep her voice even, that my word is not good enough. That's precisely what I'm saying, Lady Danbury barked, good God. Girl, you don't get to be my age without being allowed to insult anyone you please. Colin thought he heard Penelope choking, but when he stole a glance at her, there she was at his side, avidly watching the exchange. Her brown eyes were huge and luminous in her face, and she'd regained most of the colour she'd lost when Cressida had made her unexpected announcement. In fact, now Penelope looked positively intrigued by the goings-on. Fine, Cressida said, her voice low and deadly. I will bring you proof in a fortnight's time. What sort of proof? Colin asked then mentally kicked himself. The last thing he wanted to do was embroil himself in this mess. But his curiosity had gotten the better of him. Cressida turned to him, her face remarkably placid, considering the insult she'd just been dealt by Lady Danbury. Before countless witnesses, you shall know it when I deliver it, she told him archly, and then she held out her arm waiting for one of her minions to take it and lead her away. Which was really quite amazing, because a young man, a besotted fool, from all appearances materialised at her side, as if she'd conjured him by the mere tilt of her arm. A moment later they were gone. Well, Lady Danbury said, after everyone had stood in reflective awe, maybe stunned silence for nearly a minute. That was unpleasant. I've never liked her. Colin said, to no one in particular. A small crowd had gathered around them, so his words were heard by more than Penelope and Lady Danbury. But he didn't much care, Colin. He turned to see Hyacinth skidding through the crowd, dragging along Felicity Featherington as she barreled to his side. What did she say? Hyacinth asked breathlessly, We tried to get here sooner, but it's been such a crush. She said exactly what you would have expected her to say. He replied, Hyacinth pulled a face, men are never good for gossip. I want exact words. It's very interesting, Penelope said suddenly. Something about the thoughtful tone of her voice demanded attention. And in seconds the entire crowd had quieted, 
Speak up. Lady Danbury instructed. We're all listening. Colin expected such a demand to make Penelope uncomfortable. But whatever silent infusion of confidence she'd experienced a few minutes earlier was still with her. Because she stood straight and proud as she said. Why would someone reveal herself as Lady Whistledown? For the money, of course, Hyacinth said. Penelope shook her head, yes, but you'd think that Lady Whistledown would be quite wealthy by now. By God, she's right, Lady Danbury exclaimed. Perhaps Cressida merely sought attention, Colin suggested. It wasn't such an unbelievable hypothesis. Cressida had spent the bulk of her adult life trying to place herself at the centre of attention. I'd thought of that, Penelope allowed. But does she really want this sort of attention? Lady Whistledown has insulted quite a few people over the years. No one who means anything to me. Colin joked. Then, when it became obvious that his companions required an explanation, he added. Haven't you all noticed that Lady Whistledown only insults the people who need insulting? Penelope cleared her throat delicately. I have been referred to as an overripe citrus fruit. He waved off her concern, except for the bits about fashion, of course. Penelope must have decided not to pursue the matter any further, because all she did was give Cole a long Assessing stare before turning back to Lady Danbury and saying, Lady Whistledown has no motive to reveal herself. Cressida obviously does. Lady Danbury beamed. Then all at once her face scrunched into a frown. I suppose I'll have to give her the fortnight to come up with her proof, fair play and all that. I, for one, will be very interested to see what she comes up with, Hyacinth put in. She turned to Penelope and added, I say, you're very clever. Did you know that? Penelope blushed modestly. Then she turned to her sister and said, We must be going, Felicity. So soon, Felicity asked, and to his horror, Colin realised that he'd mouthed the very same words. Mother wanted us home early, Penelope said. Felicity looked truly perplexed. She did, she did, Penelope said emphatically. And besides that, I am not feeling well, Felicity nodded glumly. I shall instruct a footman to see that our carriage is brought around. No, you stay, Penelope said. Placing a hand on her sister's arm, I will see to it. I will see to it, Colin announced. Really, what was the use of being a gentleman when ladies insisted upon doing things for themselves? And then, before he even realised what he was doing, he'd facilitated Penelope's departure, and she left the scene without his ever having apologised to her. He supposed he should have deemed the evening a failure for Thatrison alone, but in all truth, he couldn't quite bring himself to do so. After all, he'd spent the better part of five minutes holding her hand,